Heavenly Father, what a wonderful privilege again to have your word in our hands. And we are ready again to study together. And as we progress through the prophecies, through your Bible, we ask that you may be with us in a very special way, again, today. Let your spirit open the word, and may the light shine in. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear friends, welcome again to our series which we are busy with, give me the Bible and the Bible only. Today's topic will be the topic, law and grace. I think it's a very important topic. Perhaps you've heard about it or uh, you've seen it on television or read about it. Judge Roy Moore in America decided to erect a monument of the Ten Commandments in front of his court building. And then he was, he was prohibited to do it because it's against the law. Now, this sounds strange, but in actual fact, a mini-prophecy is being fulfilled here. Uh, the prophecy we find in Revelation 13 and 14, where we read about this great cosmic controversy surrounding true worship and false worship at the end of time. The conflict between those who want to worship God and those who want to worship the beast. We read about the climax of the end of time in Revelation 14. We're back to the three angels' message. Verse 12, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith in Jesus. Now, in the book of Revelation, it's very clear that, this, that Satan has targeted one specific aspect, and that is that he has targeted the law of God. He wants to do away with the law, with the Ten Commandments. Now, we live in a time of rebellion against any form of law. Nations today are actually powerless against gangs roaming the streets in the neighborhoods and even in the cities, murder, theft, chaos, has actually become a sign of our time. And, and just when you think that you've now seen the ultimate, you open the newspaper the next morning and something much more shocking confronts you. In fact, there are two things which Satan wants to do away with. Not only the law, there's something else as well. He wants to do away with obedience to the Ten Commandments, the law. But then, listen carefully. He also wants to do away with the Bible truth regarding righteousness by faith alone. Salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ alone. He also wants to do away with that. Now, in Revelation 13, we read about the little horn, power, and how the beast managed to get the church to the point where the plain gospel had been put aside and in its place a false teaching of salvation. A teaching of salvation through works and faith has been established. Now, you've, you've already heard this, perhaps even from a pulpit. The law has been done away with. You've heard this 
The law has been nailed to the cross. Perhaps you've heard this. We are no more under the law, we are now under grace. And in the New Testament we have a new law, namely, love. Well, wasn't it Jesus himself that said that we should love God and our neighbor? Yes, it was. Let's read it. John 13, 34. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. And in uh, Mark 12, 30, 31, we read, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Yes, he did say it. But did you know that, that he was in actual fact quoting the Old Testament when he was saying that? Let's read. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. So what he was saying was not really new. He's quoting the Old Testament. It, it, it was new for the people who were listening to him. Now in the Greek there's two words, both translated with the word new. The first Greek word is the word neos, neos, which means new as if it has never existed before. But then there's another word. The word is karnas meaning new for the individual. It has existed before, but it's now, it's new for them. They did not know it up until now, but now they know it, and now it's new for them. Now, John makes this very clear in Second John, verse 5. Let's read. And now I beseech you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And, and then John goes on and he says something very significant. He says, and this is love. And this is love. Now what is love? What, what's the definition of love? Now you might be tempted to, to quote 1 Corinthians 13 now. But you know, that only tells us how love looks in practice. Love is kind, love, love is patient, it's not puffed up, love envies not, love is not easily provoked, rejoices in the truth, and love thinks no evil. But now John comes and he, he says something else. He says, this is love. Here, here is the biblical definition of love. Listen. And this is love that we walk after his commandments. In other words, one cannot replace the Ten Commandments with love. The truth is that the Ten Commandments is love. Love is to keep the commandments. So the law is love, the Bible says. But then the Bible also says that God is love. The law is love and God is love. Now, from your school days, you would remember that if you've got an object here that's equal to an object there, and uh, it's also equal to an object there, then it means that those two objects there are also equal to each other, isn't it? So if law is love and God is love, then it means that the law, the Ten Commandments, is in actual fact a description of who God is. The Ten Commandments 
reveals the love and the character of God. Paul actually made it very clear in Romans 13, verse 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loves another has fulfilled the law. Which law is he talking about? Well, the next verse tells us. For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not be, bear false witness. And he goes on quoting the Ten Commandments. And that includes the Sabbath. All of them, put together, added together, spells love. In other words, add all the commandments together and you have love. Take one away. And you do not have love anymore. How can you say that you love your neighbor but you've, you're having a, an affair with his wife? All ten. Take one away and it's not love anymore. Now, now we can actually understand why the Antichrist has got a much easier work to do. He need not do away with all the commandments. He only needs to do away with one. Take one away, and it's not love anymore. Now, James confirms this. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Why? Because if you break, if you break one, it's not love anymore. Think about it, dear friends. Just think about it. Nobody really has a problem with the law. It's, it's in actual fact very strange to hear people say that there's been done away with the law. Because if that's the case, the question that arises, am I now free to break the law? No, they say you're not free to break the law. But where's the logic, where's the logic now? If the, law, if the law is gone, but I'm not allowed to break it, then it's not gone. What is it? Or is there something wrong with my brain now? You see, the, the problem is not the law. You can go to any place on earth and they will tell you uh, you may not kill somebody. It's against the law. You may not steal and everybody says yes. You may not commit adultery and everybody's happy and says amen. But the moment, the moment you get to the fourth commandment, which says you must keep the Sabbath holy, all of a sudden you get this reaction. No, 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 there's been done away with the law. We, we now just need to love each other. We are under grace, not under law anymore. Now tell me, what does it mean to be under grace? Does that mean that I'm now free to break the law? No, they say, you may not break the law. So, so what happened now? What happened then? So Jesus died on the cross. He took away the law. He took away the Ten Commandments. They were nailed to the cross. But after the cross, nine of them were brought back. Except one. Namely the fourth. You see, brother and sister, the problem is not the law. The problem, in actual fact, is the Sabbath. That's the problem. Now let's ask Jesus himself. Lord, did you do away with the law on the cross? Did you do away with the Ten Commandments? Here's his answer. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy but to fulfill. In basic English it reads, Let there be no thought that I have come to put an end to the law or the prophets. I've not come for destruction, but to make complete. Now, that answer deals with it, doesn't it? It does not matter who they are that's saying this. 
It does not matter with what authority they are saying it. It does not matter from which denomination or big church they are coming. Do not even think that I came to destroy, de destroy the law. Do not even think that I came to destroy the law. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. You see, we by nature cannot keep the law. Jesus came to fulfill the law in my place, in your place. He died for us. He rose from death. He ascended to heaven. At present, He's preparing a place for you and for me in heaven. And He will come back to take us home. And the moment I accept Him as my Lord and Savior, I can be part of His kingdom because He fulfilled the Ten Commandments in my place. That which the first Adam could not do. Now, the next question, if that's the case now, that, that Jesus fulfilled the law in my place, am I now free to break it? Do not even think about it. Let there be no thought in that direction. I tell you the truth, Jesus says. Now, do you think if he says, I'm telling you the truth, it's the truth? I think so. Listen. For truly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass, one stroke or one pronunciation mark shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And then this frightening verse. Whoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, and shall teach men so, shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever shall do or teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 21, where Jesus himself is speaking. You've heard that it was said of them, of the old time, you shall not kill. And whoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, that whoever is angry with his brother, without a cause, shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever shall say, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. You've heard that it was said by them of old time that you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now, Jesus is not saying here yeah, you may kill somebody, but you must just not be angry with him. Now, what's he saying? Now, you know what he's saying? In actual fact, he's saying you... Say that you are keeping the Ten Commandments. You are keeping the law of God. God, And therefore, God now has the obligation, has the responsibility to save you because you're keeping the law. But let me tell you, frankly, when you call your brother a fool, you are guilty of murder. Now, is Jesus doing away with the commandment, you shall not kill? Of course not. In actual fact, he's, he's alleviating it. He is intensifying the law. He's making it impossible for anybody to say, Lord, I have kept your law, and now you can save me so that I need not have to be saved by faith and grace alone. He makes it impossible for anyone to say that. Now perhaps you, must, you may think, but why, why do we only look at these easy texts? Why? Do we not go to those difficult 
sticks on the Sabbath. Are there some of them? Yes, there are. So let's go there. There are a few very difficult texts concerning the law and grace. They come from Paul. Now, to help us in this regard, I, need, I think we should try and get a few keys to open these texts. Just to realize at the end that they're not that difficult at all. Yes, let's, let's admit that Paul made a few very strange comments in this regard. When you take Paul's words out of its context, it might just sound that Paul says it is done away with the law. There's been done away with the Ten Commandments. Did you know that even Peter battled at times to understand uh, what Paul was saying? Peter was a common fisherman. Paul was this learned scholar. Perhaps he could speak 10 or 12 languages. And therefore, listen to Peter and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to understand. Some things are hard to understand. Poor Peter. Yes, there, there are three such difficult texts. But just, let's, uh, let, let's look at the first one and we get the first key. Uh, and then we study a little deeper. Romans 3.28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. What's, what's Paul saying here? He's saying that you are only going to be saved by faith alone. You're not going to be saved by keeping the Ten Commandments. Nobody will be saved by keeping the law. Now, if that is what Paul was saying, and if that was all that he was saying, we might just conclude that he's saying that we need not obey the law anymore, that the law has been taken away. But, but that's not all he had to say. Read it in its context. He goes on. Let's turn to verse 31. Do we then make the law of none effect through faith? He's asking the question himself. And then he says, God forbid. No, we establish the law. Do we make the law of none effect through faith? God forbid. No, in actual fact, we establish the law. Now, for the uninformed, it's very difficult to understand how Paul gets from verse 28 to verse 31, to his conclusion being, faith does not take away the law. It establishes it. And here's the key that we need to keep in mind while we study. Faith does not take away the law, it establishes it. So therefore anybody telling you that Paul is saying that the law has been taken away, is in actual fact quoting Paul out of context. And is busy misinterpreting Paul. Do not believe them. We must get to his conclusion. That's the only way that we won't be confused by the false prophet. For the moment, the moment you get to the fourth commandment and the Sabbath, you will hear the words, there has been done away with the law. Now let's turn to the second difficult text. We find that in Romans 6, verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law but under grace. Now, there you have it. Again, on the surface it looks as if Paul is saying there's been done away with the Ten Commandments. But now, remember, he gave us the key himself. He said, grace does not take away the law. 
Now, what is Paul then in, factual, in, in actual fact saying here? If you're not under the law, but under grace, what does it mean? What does it mean to be under grace? Well, I don't know whether you've been there. Perhaps you have. I've been there. Uh, stopped. Sir, sorry. This is a 80 kilometer zone. Your speed limit was 95. You've broken the law. Do you agree? Yes, I do. I've broken the law. And then you see the man starting writing the ticket. At that point, I am under the law. I've broken the law. But then his eyes fall on a Bible lying at the back on the seat and he's asking me, where are you going? I tell him, well, I'm busy with the Bible outreach. And uh, he stops and he says, well, uh, in that case, uh, won't you just please write carefully? You may go. And he starts to tear that ticket. Am I still under the law? Yes, of course I'm still under the law. The, the law is still there. It's not been taken away. But, in actual fact, I am now also under grace. He, he need not have done that. I did not deserve it. I was guilty. But I need not pay. He tore my ticket. Now I'm under grace, and because of that, what do I do now? I put my foot on the pedal, and I drive away as fast as I can. Is that what I do? No. No, why not? Why not, my dear friends? Because he set me free. I do not want to disappoint him. He tore my ticket. He died for me on the cross. He gave his life for me. He gave me eternal life. Is there any way in which I now deliberately am going to break his law? No, as a matter of fact, I drive away at 70 kilometers an hour. Grace establishes the law. Now let's turn to our last and most difficult text. We find that in Colossians. Colossians 2, verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So there you have it now. The law was nailed to the cross. We need not keep it anymore. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Paul gave the key. Grace does not blot out the law, so this text must mean something else. Jesus said, said I did not come to do away with the law. So what is this? What is it? Let, let's read this text in its context. What does it mean to read a text in its context? Well, it means that you read a few verses before this one and you even, even read a few verses after this text. Now, first let's read on. Let's turn to verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of a new moon or of the Sabbath day. What? How does it seem to me as if it's becoming even more difficult? Let no man judge you on the Sabbath. It seems as if everything we've said up until now is cancelled in this one verse. But let's remember we've got a key. Paul says grace does not abandon the law. Jesus said he did not come to destroy the law. So what was Paul saying here? Uh, is Paul contradicting himself? 
No, I don't believe that. Let's, let's look at, at the text again. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. And then read the next text. Read that one also in its context, which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. Is Paul talking about Sabbaths that are shadows, or is he talking about Sabbaths that are not shadows? It seems to me that he's talking about Sabbaths that are shadows. So, what does that mean? Well, if I give you a basket with red peaches and another one with yellow peaches, and I ask you the red ones, are you going to give me both now? No. Why not? Because I only asked you the red ones. In other words, if Paul is speaking about Sabbaths that are shadows, he's not speaking about Sabbaths that are not shadows. Let's try and determine what a shadow means. Now, for this we need to turn in our Bibles to the Old Testament. Let's turn to Leviticus. Leviticus 23.3. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. So, so here is mention of a Sabbath, a weekly Sabbath. The seventh day is holy. The Sabbath is every seventh day. On this day you should come and worship God. This is the day for worship. Yes, you must worship God on every day, but this day is very special. God set this day aside. So we're referring here, well, this text is referring to the weekly Sabbath. And that Sabbath lies in the heart of the Ten Commandments, the fourth commandment. And the weekly Sabbath reminds us of the Creator God who created the earth in six days and rested on the seventh and set that day aside for His children and for Him to communicate with each other in a very special way. But now let's read also the 26th verse of Leviticus 23. And also on the tenth day of this seventh month there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation to you. It shall be to you a Sabbath of rest. And you shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even from even to even shall you celebrate your Sabbath. So here's mention of another Sabbath. The tenth day of the seventh month. Now, how frequent is that? Well, it's only once a year. So here's mention of a yearly Sabbath in contrast to the weekly Sabbath. So we've got two Sabbaths. The weekly reminding us of creation. What does the yearly Sabbath remind us of? Well, read, let's read further. Let's read verse 27. Also on the tenth day of this seventh month there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation for you. And you shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. Each yearly Sabbath had an offering attached to that, to it. An offering. So let's read about these yearly Sabbaths. In the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. Verse 5. And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the feast of the unleavened bread to the Lord. But you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord seven days, every day. 
The 15th day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. And on the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no civil work therein. So this is also like a Sabbath. And then the Bible explains itself. Listen as it concludes on the yearly Sabbath, what it says. Verse 37, Leviticus 23. These are the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And then it mentions the offering a burnt offering and a meat offering, a sacrifice and drink offerings, everything on his day, beside, except the Sabbaths of the Lord. All the yearly Sabbaths had offerings, except the seventh-day Sabbath of the Lord. During the great Day of Atonement, a goat was slain to reconcile God with his people. And before that, a, la a lamb was slain to forgive them their sins. Now, that lamb had but one purpose. And that was to point to the future, to the Lamb of God that would come to die for the sins of the people. That Lamb was a shadow of the Lamb that would come, namely Jesus Christ. The moment Jesus died, the veil in the temple tore from top to bottom. The Most Holy was revealed, and sacrifices and burnt offerings came to an end. We do not need to sacrifice anymore. But tell me, just think for a moment about this. Would it have been necessary for a man who had sinned to bring a lamb offering the day before Jesus died? The answer, of course, is yes. Would it have been necessary for that man to bring a lamb offering for his sin the day after Jesus died? The answer is no. But now, was it a sin to steal a day before Jesus died? Yes. Was it a sin to steal a day after Jesus died? Yes. There's the difference. All these yearly Sabbaths were, were part of the ceremonial laws of Moses. They were all shadows pointing to the Lamb of God that will come. At the cross, they lost their meaning. That is what was nailed to the cross. The ceremonial laws of Moses in contrast to the moral law of God. So there's two Sabbaths, the weekly referring back to creation, the yearly, that was a shadow pointing forward to Christ that would come. So actually, brothers and sisters, these texts are not that difficult when you read them in context. Uh, when, there's, therefore, when it therefore seems as if Paul is saying that there has been done away with the law, you need to ask the question, which law? Was it the moral law? Was it the ceremonial law? Uh, let's, let the Bible explain this in closing very direct to us, to us. Let's again turn to the Old Testament. At that time the Lord said to me, Make two tables of stone like the first, and come up to me into the mount, and make you an ark of wood. And I will write on the tables the words that were on the first tables which you broke, and you shall put them in the ark. 
in the ark. Two tables of stone, God's law written with the finger of God on stone. And Moses had to put them in the ark, in the most holy, in the ark of the covenant. That's where they were, the Ten Commandments. But now, let's turn to chapter 31. And we read in verse 24, 25, And it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book, in a book, until they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord, saying to them, Listen, take this book of the law and put it on the side of the ark. Not inside, on the side of the ark. Of the covenant of the Lord your God. That it may be there for a witness against you. The moral law cannot change or be taken away. The ceremonial law was nailed to the cross. Moses said that this law be put on the side of the ark of the covenant to be a witness against them. Ordinances that was against us, but that is now cancelled because Jesus came to carry that penalty on our behalf. So let's go back to our difficult text. Start again, Colossians 2.13 having forgiven all your trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Quite clear, isn't it? What was nailed to the cross? The handwriting of ordinances. The ceremonial laws with all the ordinances and sacrifices and offerings attached to it. We need not offer anymore. So, in actual fact, Paul was not talking of the Ten Commandments. He's talking about the ceremonial laws that was nailed to the cross, not the moral laws, not the Ten Commandments. God cannot change. And we cannot change Him. His law is His character. In actual fact, that's the mirror in which you see your own sin. If you've got a dirty spot on your face and you stand in front of the mirror, uh, you can stand there for days on end. That spot will not disappear. The work of the mirror is only to tell you, listen, there's a spot on your face, there's water, go and wash yourself. And Paul knew that. Listen how he, he puts it. He says in Romans 7, 7, I had not known sin, but by the law. The basic translation said, but I would not have had knowledge of sin if it were not for the law. So every time I look into this mirror of the law, I stand guilty before God and I know that I need forgiveness. Because it reflects my sin. And I don't like what I see. Now, dear friends, thank God that my obedience to the law is not going to save me. My good works are not going to get me to heaven, and my sins are not going to get me to hell. My end destiny and your end destiny will solely depend on one question. What did you do with Jesus called the cross? How does your relationship with him look like? He gave his all to you. What are you prepared to give to him? How important is this relationship to you? And if he comes to you and he says to you, this is my character, here is my character, here is my law, this is how I would like your character to look like as well. This is how I would like you to live. Keep my law. What is your answer going to be? 
Is it going to be, sorry, Lord, but I think the law is outdated. I think the law is no more. Even my pastor the other day said it from the pulpit. Lord, you've taken away the law at the cross. We don't need the Ten Commandments anymore. My prophet demonstrated it to us the other day. The law is no more. Thank you. No more. Jesus, help me. Well, can you take it? Oh, man. No more. The pot of manna, no more. No more. Break the thing. Shoot. Break it. Oh my goodness. Break it. Is it break it? Obedience. When I chopped that first thing attacking that dragon, I oh, forgive me. Did you hear him saying, when I attacked that dragon? When I, I attacked that dragon, mentioning, referring to the Ten Commandments. Is that what we're going to say? Or are we going to say, thank you, Lord, for your mercy, for your grace. What do you want me to do? As a token of my love and my appreciation, I will love you, I will worship you, and no other God. Not my assets, not my money, not my body, not my work. Dear Lord, I'll, I'll not take your name in vain and I, I will not stand untouched when it's done in my presence. I will listen to you when you tell me that the seventh day is the Sabbath day and I would adhere to it and I will keep it holy. I will accept your authority in my life. I will obey you. I will not get angry with my brother or my sister. I will not gossip. I will not backbite. I will not talk to my brother and sister behind their backs. I will not look at another man's wife or another ma wife's husband with desire. I will not tell a lie. I will not cheat anybody. I will be satisfied with what I have. That's the Ten Commandments, isn't it? Isn't it? Thank you, Lord that I need not be saved by that. Thank you. I need the law to realize my total dependence as a sinner towards my Creator and my Savior. Thank you, Lord, for the Ten Commandments. They bring me on my knees every morning and every evening. Thank you, Lord, for your grace through which I am saved. Thank you for your law because without it, I would not need grace. Did you hear what I just said? If there's no law, dear friend, what do you need grace for? You don't need it. 
What do you want to do with grace if there's no law? But the Bible says without grace, I'm not going to be saved. I'm not going to heaven. Lord, I will obey. You see, dear friends, the test at the end will be a test of obedience. Words will not be enough. The test will be obedience. You read these stickers on the, backs of, on the back of a car. Smile if you love Jesus. Wave your hand if you love Jesus. Blow your hooter if you love Jesus. But that's not what he wants. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And that's exactly what most people do not want to do. Because if love demands no more of me than to wave or to smile or to blow my hooter, I'm willing to adhere to the call to love God. But if that love is going to change my lifestyle, then it's too much. And tragically, dear friends, most people do not want the truth. They want an easy, smooth, even a convenient religion that allows them to live the way they want to and to do whatever they want to do, but still with the surety that we are going to heaven. There's a very harsh text in the Bible. Perhaps we should read it at times. 1 John 2, 4. He that said, I know him, and keeps not his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. To know him is to love him, and to love him is to obey him. The Bible is quite frank. If someone does not obey Jesus, he's an actual fact. He cannot say that he loves him. Obedience is going to be the test. 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Another translation for loving God is keeping His laws, and His law, laws are not hard. Dear friends, the Bible concludes, and uh, has these final verses in it. I'm referring to Revelation 22, 18. For I testify to every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add to these things, God shall add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. The Antichrist wants to change everything. But may our prayer be, Lord, keep us near to the cross. Keep me near to you, near to your law. Let me follow you wherever you may lead. Thank you, Lord, for your love. I want to love you too. What do you want me to do? 